We're on? Are we on? All right. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. I think I've been on for about 30 seconds probably, so apologies to everyone that's out there, but uh, welcome to Fellowship Church in White Plains, Maryland. Marvin Harris is the pastor, and a very good one, I might add. A good, a good brother in the Lord and a good man of God. And Bill, are you teaching tonight? All right, Bill Heath is teaching tonight as well, and, and, uh, but tonight we're going to focus on the Lord, amen, and we'll open with the time of worship, and Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I ask you to help our, help our hearts prepare for your worship, to worship you. Lord God, in John chapter 4, you told your disciples, and you told the woman at the well, the time is coming and has now come when the Father will seek worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And Father, as we read in Hebrews, we... We don't worship. We don't come to a mountain somewhere to worship a God that we, that we don't know. We come to the heavenly mountain, the heavenly temple, entering by the blood of Jesus to worship a God that we do know. Amen. And the world cannot see you just like you can't see the wind, but they see the effect of your spirit in our hearts. They see your hand moving. They don't, they don't know what it is. Father, I pray tonight you would open some eyes so that they can see that there is God in heaven. Take away a little bit of that mystery tonight, Father. Thank you, Lord. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, worthy to receive glory, worthy to receive honor. Worthy to receive all our praise today. Lift it up. Praise Him. Praise Him and lift Him up. Come on, praise Him. Exalt His name forever. Praise Him, praise Him and lift Him up, praise Him, exalt His name forever. Holy, 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 holy. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty, worthy to receive glory, yeah, worthy to receive honor, he is worthy to receive all our praise today, yes he is. Praise Him, praise Him and lift Him up, come on, praise Him, exalt His name forever, come on, praise Him, praise Him and lift Him up. Come on, praise Him. Exalt His name 
forever. Praise Him. Praise Him and lift Him up. Praise Him. Exalt His name forever. You know, around the throne of God right now, all day long, every day of the year, every year that's ever been on the calendar, angels and living creatures cry out, holy, holy, holy. And they never stop. So let's join with them right now. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord and God Almighty. Worthy to receive glory. You are worthy to receive honor, worthy to receive all our praise today. Amen. Let's lift up a clap to the Lord right now and lift up some praise to the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout glory to God. Glory to the God most high. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Hmm. That day is coming. That day is coming. We will stand around his throne. We will sing praises. We will shout praises. We will cast our crowns down before him. We will say, just and true are your ways, O Lord. And your judgments are true and faithful. And you have rightly judged the nations. That day is coming. Thick smoke and peals of thunder will surround the throne of God as he renders his judgments. <laughs> ah, so, that day is coming. And there's a lot of gray area on this earth, but there's only two places we'll be at that time. We'll be rejoicing before the throne, or if our name's not in the book of life, we'll be, we'll be in the other place, unfortunately. So... We, we sing holy, holy tonight, but that day is coming. So make sure you're ready. Thank you, Lord. So you probably noticed that I have a couple of folks up here with me tonight. And so uh, my friend Joe, there's a song that's special to him, and we're going to sing that. But it's also, it's a really good song. And um, so bless the Lord. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. So I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow and I know 
He watches me. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. So I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Oh, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. Brother Mark is going to come up for a word of prayer. And Father, help us to remember that always. Your eye, Lord, is on the sparrow. We have nothing to fear if you're with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Jim and friends. Amen. <laughs> All right. Glory to God. You know, praise creates an atmosphere for miracles. Praise of God. Amen. God Almighty. You look at Exodus chapter 17, God had directed Moses to go into battle against a different uh, force. And so Moses and his brother Aaron and their uh, associate servant Hur went up on a hill to pray, and Moses raised his arms and praised to God. While Moses had his arms up, his army was winning. He got tired and weary, and his arms went down, and they started losing. And Aaron and her helped him out to keep his arms up until the end of the battle. So, hey, you need, a, you need some partners out there to pray and to praise with. It's such a wonderful thing when someone calls you on the phone like someone did today. He said, Mark, I just called to pray with you. You got someone to pray with? You got someone that you might call and say, hey, can we pray? Praise the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> I've got a prayer list from Pastor Marvin, which I'll go through. I just want to mention, uh, <clears throat> you know, if any of you should ever have an opportunity, you know someone who knows someone who's incarcerated? I'll tell you what, it's a very, very lonely place to be. Uh, and some of them are without hope, and they need some hope. Charles Stanley was teaching on hope this morning. And uh, my sister Mary, I'm sorry, my daughter Mary on the phone was uh, informing me about a, a girlfriend of hers who I made acquaintance of probably 15-ish years ago. All right, so Michelle is 37 years of age, and she's been uh, incarcerated for uh, something like three and a half years on a 13-year sentence. And in Delaware, they don't have parole. You've got to do like 85% of your sentence. 
And there might be some particulars like earn a good time, that kind of thing. I don't know. Uh, but I just encourage you, hey, if you have opportunity to send a, a, a word of hope, a couple, maybe a scripture verse or something like that, maybe a money order, 20 bucks, help them out. Uh, here's a young lady, like I said, I'm, I haven't seen her probably 15, maybe 17 years, and she's 37 years old now. And she's going to be locked up for another 10 years. 37 years old, been locked up for three and a half years. And I, I've sent her a letter, and I haven't, you know, of course, it just went out a couple of days ago. Uh, but just my heart goes out to her, and I, I know some other people that I correspond with that are incarcerated. So, hey, let's get into uh, the prayer list. And I, I always like to say, and I will continue to say, we're praying because we know God is hearing, He's answering. And we're praying and we're thanking him for what he's been doing for these people that we're praying for, what he's doing now, and what he will continue to do. Uh, so for we are praying for salvation prayer requests for Timoth Timothy Towson, I'm sorry, Timothy Towson, Townsend, the Newman family, Myron's Aunt Shirley, Pickerel, and Hawkins family. On the prayer request, we're praying for Garnett Anderson. Cheryl and Angelo Farr, Rita Younger, Melissa Seacrest for her health. <clears throat> it's pastor's, uh, pastor's daughter, Melissa. Cheryl Farr is his daughter. Michelle Turley, Chloe Saul, and her baby, Malik James. Mike Morris, pastor's grandson and granddaughter, Ella Mason and Evan Mason. Praise your Lord. Keeping those uh, young a young man, young lady, safe, and uh, continue to bless each step that they take. Lydia Witten, Michelle Waddell, Betty Stepp, Jimmy Ryan, Dan, Dan Duty, Bill Laracy, and daughter Dawn, pastor's son Tommy Harris, and his wife and, and children. They got a household full of them, and they moved down south a few months back. Uh, Sherry Greenhow, <clears throat> Brenda Greer, and another notation on Myron's on Shirley has COVID, Butch Lysinger, Danny and Carolyn McKinney, Kimberly Harris, Jim Heath, Paul Fickner, Jim Bowie's sister Sharon, diagnosed with brain tumor, and my heart goes out to her. We do pray, Lord, for full and complete healing. And for Jim, pray for Jim's health and uh, happiness for Jim, the joy that only comes from the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. We used to like to sing that song in the pastor's <clears throat> Bible study back when we were doing a singles thing. Janice Haig and Linda Griffith, that's L. Berenger's sisters. Let's see, Karen Burke and I think this says Pam Burke. Brian Fletcher lost his younger sister this past week. So we're praying for Brian and the rest of the family as they grieve this loss. We're praying for Joey and Mary, Josh Bosman, Rose Proctor, Ron Brashler. Let's see. <clears throat> uh, pastor's daughter Rachel had an operation on her thyroid. He says the doctors were quite happy with the outcome. So we thank you and praise you, Lord, for that. And uh, whatever the cause, Lord, we just pray that you strengthen Rachel's immune system, strengthen her body, and uh, quick recovery from that. I suppose it was a minor surgery in regards to discomfort and that kind of thing, but quick recovery anyway. And we are praying. Pastor, did you say that Joe Kaczewski is having the operation on his heart tomorrow. We're also praying for his brother Stan and their, wife, and their mom Dixie. But Joe is going in for surgery tomorrow. So, Father, we do pray uh, for your guidance, guidance for the surgical team and that the, sur that the operation room would be without any kind of virus or germs, that kind of thing, and a quick recovery. Uh, Donna Horton, Christina Crown, John and Dory Hardesty, Pastors in laws, Debbie Bewer, Ginger and 
A.J. Connigan and family, uh, Michael Winston, Ellen Broadwater, the Melbergs, Robert Pickle, Irma Johnson, Dale Hayes, Robbie Anderson, Steve and Brenda Sears, Charles and the Newman family, Debbie Roberts, Owen Riley's father, David Matty, Jeff Burke or Birch, Dave Beam, haven't heard anything new on Dave Beam, but he had an operation on his eye, well, was he had a cancerous tumor behind his eye. But I trust that that was, uh, that that went well, and we're praying for continued healing, full and complete healing for Dave, and we're praying for his wife, can't remember her name. Uh, Amy Woodward, jo Joan Hall, notation that she is home now, glad to hear that. Joseph, comma, Kelly and family, Tiffany. Oh, Tiffany is the next word down, next name down. Uh, <clears throat> the Baker family in West Virginia. Joanne Duke. And uh, you probably heard this past Sunday that we're remembering the passing eight years ago of Pastor's grandson, Micah. And uh, we know that he is in heaven and we are relieved and comforted in that. Brenda Sears' brother, Tom. Steve Griffith, Rose Younger, Aiden Sweeney. Okay, so we have a, <clears throat> a kind of an umbrella prayer for Southern Maryland Christian Academy <clears throat> and family, family <clears throat> excuse me, Fellowship Church uh, for the school, the staff, the students. Well, praying for <clears throat> protection against, I guess particularly of COVID and all its variants and we can say, hey, flu season's coming up. Pray for all these students and, and the teachers and <clears throat> the staff members, uh, Matt Gaines and uh, the rest of his family. <clears throat> Excuse me. Praying for the President of the United States. One might ask, how can we pray for something we didn't vote for or maybe we don't like him? You know, Apostle Paul says, pray for your government. And we're praying for their salvation, and we pray that any opportunity we had to pray for someone's salvation, if we can encourage them in the Lord, the president, the vice president, the administrative staff, uh, Congress and Senate, all of their families. Uh, yeah, I think the first thing we need to be concerned with is their salvation, whether or not whether they're saved or not, and I don't know individually, but. Uh, and then we pray that, God, you will lead and guide them by your Holy Spirit to make wise and proper moral decisions as they lead our country, the United States of America, which we thank you, Lord, for your continued blessings and that we have opportunity to be citizens here and the freedom that we enjoy. In the uh, note under those in the military, I see a check next to Tim Harmon, who's in the Army. And I think that's, well, we're praying for the emergency medical technicians, those guys and gals that run out to direct the automobiles and that kind of thing and fly the helicopters to take them to medevac and medevac them to uh, shock trauma units with all scary situations going on, blood splurting around the place that might be infected. Uh, I'd like to, you know, come down to more specific, but I don't know anybody personally. I can't give you names on them. So maybe we'll just kind of zero in on those in our local community. And we'll say, Father, your protective hands on those first responders and those in the military who are continually protecting us. Lord, we do love you. We praise you. We genuinely do praise you and honor you. And, uh, I, you know, I hear some maybe some stories, if you will, some people had visions of heaven and whether or not this one's true or not. But Paul said he had a vision of heaven. You can read about it in, I forget if it's first or second Corinthians chapter 12, but he didn't have any details to give us. But we know this one thing that, Father, you have gone to prepare a place for us and it's your Father's house. There are, you have many places and you're going to prepare a place for us. You're coming back, as your word says, to receive us that where you are, there we may be 
also. And we're talking about eternity if you have not made a decision to turn your life over to Christ as your Savior. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. We're not promised tomorrow. Father, we love you. Thank you for your continued answer to prayer. Thank you for Pastor Marvin and our teacher, Bill Heath, this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mark. I just wanted to tell you one blessing. Um, I got a call today at 10 o'clock from Japan. And uh, don't ask me where in Japan, but let me say this. The guy said to me, Pastor Marvin, do you remember me? He said, I used to go to your church. I started here in 2003, and he was here, and he left in 2007. He said, um, I've been in Japan all these years. And uh, it was such a joy. He said, God, the Holy Spirit, told me to call you. He said, I was getting ready to go to bed. It was 10 o'clock their time uh, at night. You're probably familiar with that, huh, Bill? <laughs> and uh, uh, we had the w most wonderful time on the phone. And the blessing is, I said, Tim, I said, you have been on our prayer list since you left, since 2007. And I had not heard from him, but we've been praying for him for, what, 14 years. And he said, God has blessed him. He said, uh, had a terrible tragedy with his wife dying of cancer in 2017. You remember Tim Harmon? I thought you would, Randy. And, and he said they had a little boy together who is now nine years old. And he said, uh, I believe he said in the next five or so months, he's going to come back to this area. And uh, he'll be over uh, Walter Reed for a while. I don't know for how long. But what a joy. And the blessing to me as the preacher is that we've had the privilege to pray for him all these years. And he's needed some prayer, but he's, grow, he's really grown in the Lord. And I was just so touched to hear from him after 14 years. Is that a blessing? And then another blessing. Uh, I've told you all about a girl named Kathy Perkinson that got saved in front of my shop. And this morning, about four in the morning, I'm up, and I thought, you know, I wonder where Kathy's at, because I've talked about her here. And so I looked online, and believe it or not, I found her and her husband. And I found her son's name, and I found her sister's name. They all used to come to my shop. And uh, I was disappointed uh, Actually, I think, Bill, you talking to me last night about the Gideon New Testaments fired me up because she got saved in front of my shop with a Gideon New Testament. You're going to tell about those for a minute but when you come up? Would you do that? And, and she got saved, and right before I left the shop, she came over and pointed to where she got saved and wept, started to weep. Well, I looked, and I found her name, and I, my heart was broken, but it was sad because, I mean, it was, I was happy because I knew that she had gotten saved, but she died in uh, July of 2020 of the virus, of the COVID. But um, that little New Testament, God the Holy Spirit used that, and uh, I'll never forget that day. I'm trying to call her husband now to get a hold of him. Bill, are you ready? I'm ready. Right, get ready. You all better buckle your seatbelts. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 58. Uh, this is a life-changing chapter. Come on up and speak to us, Bill. And mention those Bibles. <laughs> well, good evening, Fellowship Church. Before we go to the Old Testament, let's talk about the Gideons in these little pocket Bibles. They're the New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs. They're very handy because they have helps and scripture references at the beginning and the clear plan of salvation at the end. You can dedicate them to a person. And I'll speak more of it on Sunday or when we're really prepared because I like to have some to hand out too. Um, but we go to schools. We just distributed 350 in DC in the mall area but not just distribute, you talk with people where they are, 
in their knowledge of the Bible, in their knowledge of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. What do they believe? And it's a wonderful way to witness, plus give them this word that can witness to them until they die, any time it can speak. We don't know when the word of God will speak to different people at different times, when God draws them. So let's go to the Old Testament, Isaiah 58. This chapter is called God's Chosen Fast. And it's talking about fasting, and that's a topic. Well, first of all, the book of Isaiah. Let's go a little bit into the prophet. Isaiah is one of the major prophets, the first one after Song of Songs. He's writing about 100 years before the downfall of Judah in Jerusalem. And he's given the nation, the people, a warning. He's given a religious nation and a religious people a warning from God. Because what? There's hypocrisy in the people, in their worship. And he's going to tell them what that hypocrisy is. That means being double-faced, saying one thing and doing another thing and how to correct it. And then we go to, oh, it relates to fasting. And some, we'll see, have a misunderstanding of what fasting is, going without food. And, you know, one of the, I think one of the great sins of myself and of our nation of having abundance is gluttony because we eat too much. And when you eat too much, you get tired. When you eat too much, you get overweight. And our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. However, there's a balance in that. Because what does eating do? A lot of time and preparing and working for. And what do we do with the money we work for? But first, do we work, right? Work is, is the basic foundation of humanity, of mankind. To work and labor is unto the Lord. That is precious. That is good. That is worshiping of God. We talk about raising our hands and praising the Lord. But if we don't work right unto the Lord in these daily things, we can't really worship the Lord without hypocrisy. Because a Christian is separated from the world to call to excellence. To do everything we do, eat, drink, work, unto the Lord. And the days are evil, it's to redeem the time. That our time is spent effectively and to his glory. Why are we created? All mankind is created for one purpose, to glorify God. And from the beginning, but there was a rebellion, and then there was a downfall of man through Adam and Eve and Genesis. And we're all victims. We're all sinners through Adam's sin. And only Jesus Christ can fulfill, satisfy God's anger, God's um, disappointment in mankind because of their sin of disobedience from the Garden of Eden. Only Jesus Christ was perfect to take our place on, for our sins on the cross at Calvary 2,000 years ago. But getting to this thing of Isaiah 58. Some of you have heard Tim Hennings. He came here, and his last message, he two messages ago, he talked, oh, should I fast? And I have the same thing, so I can identify. We think, should I fast for this or that? And then the Lord spoke to him, don't fast, just do it. You know what's right. Just go ahead by faith. There's a time to fast and a time not to fast. And religion can get us all frustrated when's the right time because we need to be in obedience and God will give us the power and let us know when to fast, when it's needed, especially for major decisions and changes in our lives and others' lives in the church, the area that we're in. So this is sort of a background. Isaiah has 66 chapters. God has inspired, to a great degree, the chapters of the Bible. 
They didn't have no chapters until about 1351 by Archbishop, uh, I forget his name now, <laughs> Stephen Langton. And then they were first implemented in the Wycliffe Bible, 1382. He's the morning star of the Reformation. So the chapters that we have are for a purpose, and 40 of them go along with 39, 1 to 39. How many books do we have in the Old Testament? 39. How many in the New Testament? 27. The chapters in Isaiah, 1 to 39, talk about the holiness of God, the Old Testament. When you get to chapter 40, it's a big division. 40 to 66 talk about the love of God. And specifically, that's in three parts. Chapter 58, what we're talking of today, goes until 66. And it's really the word of God as it's inspired, preparing us to, especially Israel, not so much us, but us too, yes. He's going to return and set up his kingdom on earth. That's when Christ returns for the millennial reign, a thousand-year reign, to sit on the throne of David in Israel, in Jerusalem. And that's when uh, we come to Sunday, to the, we're having a discussion panel on the book of Revelation, and we'll get more into that and to understand it. But let's look at these verses. One and two. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up not thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression. This is God speaking to Isaiah. Show my people their transgression, their sin, their disobedience. And the house of Jacob, their sins. There was the house of Israel, then the house of Jacob, or Judah. Really, they're all together, all 12 tribes now. Sorry. What is their transgression? Well, listen to this. It sounds very good unless you understand the context. Yet they seek me daily. They seek God daily in religious ways and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness. You notice it says did, not does, <laughs> in the act of, did in the past. They did what was right, full of right before God, according to what is written in the law of Moses and the prophets. When we do what is right, there's no regret. So we have a difficult time at times especially if we're not saved in Christ, the Holy Spirit's not in us, it's very difficult to do what's right. And then we can't do right consistently without the power of God. There's a, that's what gives us the power to always do what's right. And as a nation that did righteousness, a nation, it's not just the people, as a nation, they're turned away. And forsook not the ordinances of their God. They were coming to the temple, to the church. They were bringing the sacrifices. They were going by a lot of the Mo Moses laws. And forsook not the ordinance of their God, they ask of me the ordinances of justice, to be just. And they take delight in approaching the God. Now the next verse will reveal, hey, I want to come to God. I want to do this and that. They think they are in their own minds. Our hearts can deceive us. Feelings can deceive us. But the word of God never does. The Holy Spirit in us never does. Wherefore have we fasted, they're saying, and thou seest not. You don't see us when we fast? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul? Oh, we have gone hungry, we have, in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church would beat their own selves as part of making themselves worthy before God. They thought that was the way to do it, the monks and the monasteries. It takes on different forms in different ways at different times in history. And thou takes no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure doing what you want, and exact all your labors. You mean, 
you put on sackcloth or you put on certain clothes to represent your fasting. Maybe you tell others. Jesus is just the opposite. He's counterculture. The culture we're in today, Jesus is the opposite. His is a whole distinct lifestyle and way of living that we all become one in when we're born again and as we grow in Christ. The things that divide us are really, I would say, foolish in the eyes of God. Foolishness. But what his design and intent is one heart, one mind in the local church. And each local church is different. What else? Behold, you fast for strife and debate. You're having problems and you think, I'll fast and for strife and debate, for discussion and the wrong motives, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. So they had the wrong motivation for fasting. Let's see God's fast in the, the answer to this. And it's not with food. Because, you know, we think of the New Testament. Jesus said when he was taking the devils out of people, hey, you disciples, you can't do it because this only comes out by what? Prayer and fasting. Which, by the way, other versions of the Bible omit that and fasting because someone didn't like it sometime during the, the, the different translations. And Paul says the fa he fasted often. But I'm sure they did it the right way in the right time with the Holy Spirit leading them to do it for the right purpose. It was needful. It's needful at times. And I would say I may not have the power of God the way I should or could if I neglect the Spirit's prompting me to fast and pray at times and I ignore it. Because when the Spirit leads us to, it's easier to do than on our own. Especially the first day. And we, this isn't a lesson on fasting and time and ways, but let's look at this fast that God has chosen. Start on verse 5 through, let's see. Okay, is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul is to bow down his head as a bowish, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast, an acceptable day of the Lord? No, because they were doing, say, in the time of J Jonah, and the king and the whole kingdom when Jonah went to Nineveh, they did in sackcloth and ashes the right way. They repented. Repentance is part of true fasting, whatever the need is. And that was the right fast at that time for those people. But God's own people weren't fasting right. Now he says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? This is God's chosen fast that he wants us to do and I believe today the th same principles apply. To loose the bands of wickedness. There's a spiritual warfare going on. There's a battle. And to loose that bands of wickedness around those that are captive by the devil, by his angels. You know, we don't, you think, there's a lot of angels and we do the, we please, our father is the devil or it is our father is God. You know, the devil tried to take the place of God, and he's always trying to take the place of God, and he's trying to uh, take the place of Jesus Christ. One day he's going to set up uh, the Antichrist, it's called. That's in the end times, the last days. He's going to come. And he also tries to take the place of the Holy Spirit by deceptive spirits. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later because I had a personal experience with this chapter and a deceptive spirit, which I thought was right. But we'll see. 
first to lose the bands of wickedness. And that's within others that are um, outside of God, outside of the way of the true God. In a, because we, you know, a demon can't possess a true believer. He can oppress them and bother them, yes. The devil can get in, but the true believer, and especially one that's growing in Christ, he may oppress them and, and restrain for a while, but we stay faithful and persevere, we'll have the victory over that restraint that the devil tries to put on us doing the will of God. Paul experienced it when he was in Thessalonia. He was there about two months. The Lord led him through Macedonia to go to the capital, and there was a great revival. Uh, many came to be saved at the same time. Two months he was there around. Then he went to Athens and Corinth, but he said, I wanted to come back to you, but the devil restrained me. So what did he do? When the devil's restraining him, we got to pray to God, and he said, so I sent Timothy to go to you and find out what's going on about a year later. So when we can't directly do things ourselves, we know others that God has approved, that we can have confidence and trust in to do the job with us, co-laborers in the Lord. Good principles to learn when we're battling with Satan in different ways. And the second one, to undo the heavy burdens. Are you burdened? Is sin, God speaking, and you feel a burden of sin? Or do you enjoy sin? I tell you, the world and sin is enjoyable. I enjoyed sin when I was lost, till God started to call me. And that gave me a burden that I didn't understand. Why, Lord? Then eventually, he led me to someone that knew the Bible, that presented the gospel, and that burden of sin lifted up. But that's initial salvation, that each one of us, we, I hope we can point at a time, maybe not a day, but we know we're saved. We can know, not I hope so, or maybe, or I go back and forth. No, we can know it and then grow in it. But also these burdens that are put there for, I'm trying to apply it to the believer, for trials. And not for sin, because when we sin, we deserve God's hand withdrawn. Because he can't, he's holy. He can't look on sin. But for tri trials and difficulties that we're going through that we can't prevent, and we, we try to do it, we do what's right according to his word, to the best of our ability. Um, Christ said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That's another reason we pray, because others are under these burdens for different reasons. If you're free from burdens, praise God. No matter what we're going through, we can be free from those burdens that go with the trial, yet persevere and suffer with Christ through them too. The third one, to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. That yoke of sin, that bondage is... Israel had when they were slaves in Egypt. God broke the yoke through the deliverer, Moses. And he broke the yoke of mankind for the Gentiles, for the world today, through Jesus Christ. That yoke of um, bondage, of burdens, slavery, wickedness. He can break it. He does break it. It's Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. And the last one in this section, verse 7. A little bit different, but it follows. Not as important as the first three in verse 6, but let's look at verse 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? Yes, to feed the hungry. And thou shalt bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. The poor, bring them to your house to feed them, to clothe them, to help them. 
And when thou see the naked, that you cover him, and that you hide not yourself from your own flesh. And these are what you call good works, because we got to break the bonds, the bondage, the wickedness first, and then we can do good. This is not the social gospel. It doesn't replace the gospel. It's part of the gospel of every true believer, every true church, that uh, in the community where you live or as the Spirit leads. Next is verses 8 through 12. We'll go together. These are the rewards when we do God's chosen fast. What are the rewards? Then, notice the words then and if. They're very important. If and then. Then shall thy light break forth is the morning. After the nighttime, the darkness. It'll break forth as the morning. You know, sometimes we can be oppressed and the spirit is heavy and, and we, we go out in, the, in the, even the daytime and it doesn't seem that bright. But it's from within or our spiritual warfare. But then we break through in the same environment, the same time, we can go out and it seems really light, bright. <laughs> and that is the light of the truth. The light of the gospel is opposite to the darkness of wickedness of the father, the devil. There's spiritual light and spiritual darkness all around us. And we want to be we are children of light. Not that we want to be. We're born again. We're children of light, not the children of darkness. Come to church to learn of that. Listen to someone. Preach. Share the word. You have questions or doubts. And they will go away if we're hungry and seeking. And thy health shall spring forth speedily. Health is spiritual health. The church is a place for those that are spiritually sick, that need help with their souls, with our souls. It's a place for recovery. It's a place for being made whole and complete. And thy righteousness shall go forth before thee. Then we will be right with God when these things are working in us, the light, our health, spiritual health, and we will do what's right. And it will go the way before us. And the glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. Um, I change that when I rewrite it. I put it, rear guard is what re-reward is. You know, the Spirit of the Lord guards us in the back. Why? Because we're always supposed to be frontward, continuing forward for the gospel. If we're going backward or turning our backs, uh, there's something wrong. If we turn our back on reading the word, if we, turn our, if we turn our back on prayer, if we turn our back on the local church and say, oh, I'm disappointed in the people, or get your eyes focused on problems, or what you're going through. Um, the whole armor of God, they're all things in the front, from the helmet to the feet prepared with the gospel of peace. Learning how to put on this armor it has no back protection. But God is still our rear guard because the enemy will protect, attack us when we turn. And if you're a child of God, still he'll have mercy in, in our backslidden state, in our whatever we're going through because of our deceit of man can lead us to do that. Different reasons, traditions. He wants us to change, to draw closer to him. What about verse 9? Then thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. When you call and the Lord answers, you don't need nothing else. You just know he heard, and he is good. And you can have a peace and trust him. Because he knows the long game, the end game. And we know it too, it's written. And he has that cry. And he shall say, God shall say, here I am. He isn't somebody we can't know. 
He's a, especially in the New Testament, even more, he's our father, our daddy. Intimate relationship. Not a faraway God. Here I am. If thou take away, well, let's go back to, now we won't get there yet. Okay. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the yoke of what? Bondage of sin, of wickedness, of doing my own thing my own way when I want to. I mean, I did that when I was young, as the Apostle John says. When I was young, I used to do these things. Yes, that's the, foolish, the foolishness of youth. But when I am old, I'll no longer go my own way, my own time. And that's a great blessing. That is where true liberty is, true peace in this truth of the ways of God. If you take away from you the miss, the yoke, the putting forth of the finger... You know who points fingers? Whether it's literally or with your mouth or mind, you blame others. You blame others for doing stuff that maybe, or even culture and society is structural within the system. No, you're blaming others for your problems, for your sin. And we each individually accountable from the bottom up that's why we have the Constitution. Our nation is grounded in men of Scripture, but there's always been good and evil, no matter how good a nation is, how good their foundings are, and there's transformation over time. So putting forth of the... Don't blame others. Don't put forth your finger. Take accountability for our own lives and that we may encourage one another, love one another, share the truth, these things, we aren't pointing fingers at others. We're helping others. That's breaking the, the chosen fast that God has for us. And speaking vanity. You know, foolishness, things we don't need to speak. Weigh our words carefully. Our thoughts carefully. Because God knows them anyways. <laughs> Just we don't know everybody's thoughts, but God knows them. There's no private place there's no, give me space, <laughs> with God. Because he's there all the time. Whether we realize or understand it or not. But we won't understand it until we repent of our sins. And not just come to Christ, but surrender your life to him. Totally. Amen. That's a place to get to. That's our sanctification. Verse 10. If you draw your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity. It will rise from the darkness. And your darkness shall be as the noonday. It shall change that darkness to light, to the afternoon, the brightness. Now, I'll tell you my experience I had with this spiritually. When I was a young Christian, about 23, and I was saved. I came to Christ through a cultic group called the Children of God. And there was a young man, his name is Danny Vargas, in the military. And he shared, he was telling me, you're wrong. Your group is wrong. And I wasn't, I know it's not, because we thought we were God's chosen 144,000. We had our own prophet and own writings besides the Bible alone. That's all we need is scripture alone. When we start listening to any man more than scripture alone or any writing or book, it's, it's, we got to be very careful how we're fed, who we're listening to. So I went over to see him in the barracks after we had a long discussion, a couple hours, why uh, the group I was with, why I was wrong, why he was right. And I went... And he was on his bunk on his bed. And I, I seen that, wow, he's laying down, and he has his Bible on his chest. <laughs> and, but I said, wow, he's a really weak person. Like he, he's, he was a frail person. But he was a true Christian, trying to help me as a young Christian, but in deceit by a false teacher. Then I went back to my room, 
thinking, oh, he doesn't, he isn't really right because he looks so weak. And, and, and I got back to my room and I really prayed because I wanted to know, am I right or wrong? And then God gave me an experience. Some call it like the Kundalini experience. Eastern religions have it, where your chakra rises and you get this, this ecstasy and light that comes into you. Like the Mormons, we had this warm feeling. But this is even brighter and more powerful. And because I had that experience, and I read this chapter and these verses, but still it was a deceptive spirit that feeling, that emotion. I didn't know it. It kept me stronger in the way I was going, the experience. <laughs> but then through time, I met my wife, met some people in a local church, and the scripture I did memorize helped me, delivered me from the cultic group as the time of Lot. God delivered him out of Sodom and Gomorrah. God knows those that are his, and he will deliver them. So that was an experience where I interpreted it as from God, and, but it really wasn't. <laughs> so that's my little testimony about this. But he's talking spiritually. We will rise as from the obscurity and darkness to light as the, as the sun in the bright of the day, our daily lives that we're walking with God, children of the light, spiritually. So if we feel tired or a little bit out of it or are not there, pray, seek God. There's, there's a reason. We want to all have this spiritual fast, God's chosen fast. Then verse 11 to 12, And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy your soul in draught when it's dry. And make fat thy bones. That is not physical, but spiritually fat, healthy, spiritually. And thou shalt be like a water garden. Song of Songs talk about gardens. And like a spring of water whose waters fail not. The spring that's continually fresh waters. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places those that follow you when you're doing the right way as, as leaders in the church. Others will follow us. And they will build up the waste places. We have waste places in our, around us, people around us. It's waste, what we're doing many ways. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of past to dwell in. Repairing those breaches where the enemy has come in and broken those walls, has destroyed those doors. We're to rebuild these breaches that Nehemiah did physically in Jerusalem, in Ezra. Rebuilding them, repairing them. That's something we can always do. And restore of the past to dwell in. And the finish, verse 13 and 14, it finishes odd in a way. You don't need these verses, but it talks about the Sabbath day. It was very important in the Old Testament to rest on the Sabbath. Due to time, I won't take, I'll, I'll make it quick. The, the church, especially the time of the Puritans of, of um, early 1900s, they would call Sunday the Sabbath day. And we can call Sunday the Sabbath day, too. Where day we look forward to and do what's right in it. And what is that? We give at least one day a week unto the Lord. We give that day fully to him, to rest in him, in his word, in his people, and doing what's right like Jesus did. He helped people. He healed people. He did these things all days. But on the Sabbath when he did it, they said, oh, no, he's not obeying the law of Moses. So keep that a special day, the Sabbath. It's the only one that's not repeated in the New Testament of the Ten Commandments. Why? Hebrews 4 says every day is a Sabbath, whether we're working or whatever we're doing unto the glory of God. 
But we, a special day is the actual Sunday, the resurrection day, when we rest in a, in a way that's separated from the, the week's labors and commit it unto the Lord. So I'll finish with that. Wherever you're going to church, some go to different churches, or especially here, this local church, pray about the Sundays and come ready to, to be a blessing to others. And look forward to it. That is our Sabbath today. I'm going to finish with a word of prayer. And let's see. Um, I'll finish the word of prayer. Lord God, we do thank and praise you for your word. And we know some have heard this before, Isaiah 58. And, but it's just may you speak the hearts fresh and new as you did mine. As you gave Marvin this same passage to cover with the Jude house a couple weeks ago. And, and you put it on my heart at the, the same time. We don't know, Lord God. We're, we're weak. We're frail. But we rely on the strength of, of you, God, to lead us in your word. To lead us what needs to be um, done to, to please you as a, as a local church, as people, as, as to um, follow Jesus. As we want to labor together, we want to be used of you here, where we are, here and now. Have mercy and pray your abundant grace and lead in ways which we know not, but you know these paths to be restored in. You know what breaches to repair, the repair of the breaches. Help us be work with you, Lord, to repair these breaches to restore these paths, to be made whole, each one of us. And those that come in, that you draw in to the service when we come together, that you be present because our lives are praying, are, we're living, and, and we permit you to, to be there in, 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 in real ways when we gather together on Sundays. <laughs> Speak to us in, in ways that we can we, we don't even think of until you put it in our minds and hearts. But we give our all to you, fresh and new. In Jesus' name, amen. You're welcome. Praise the Lord. See you Sunday or 8.30 at men's breakfast or men and women's breakfast. <laughs>